Yeah. So with the vows, I know some of you have taken the Bodhisattva vows, but there's two two levels. We talk about the aspiring vows. And then we talk about the engaging vows. The engaging vows is when we uh, take the vows on a mental continuum. And along with that comes the practice of the six perfections. So um, the booklet, I forgot about the booklet for um, body sat for vows. Oh, you in there. Um, each of the body sat for vows are, are grouped under each of the six perfection so it says oh these ones are about generosity and so forth so today we're going to look at those um uh, six perfections and so we can start with um in the Lama Chirpa book that uh, page 90, LC 101, or actually 91, because it's in English. So in the Refuge in Bodhicitta prayer, it says, by the practice of um, giving and the other perfections. So the first one is the practice of generosity and the other perfections is the remaining five. So by my practice of that. So say, you know, to have this very human life, not just human life, but um, perfect human rebirth with all the conditions that we have and engage and interest in the Dharma and so forth and so forth, all of these conditions is through having practiced pure ethics in past lives in the context of having taken vows. So we can say we've taken the Bodhisattva vows before. So Bodhisattva vows, refuge vows, we only take we take, when we take, we take for this lifetime. Refuge and then tantric vows subsequently we take for all future lives. Which, you know, at first you think, oh, well, that's a bit of a concern. How do I know what my future lives are going to be? How can I know I'm going to maintain the vows? So usually it says, when again born human. And so just having that interest, we could say, is a ripening of that from past lives. You know, it'd be wonderful if we remembered it all. But, uh, that's okay. It's it, it's okay. It's okay. Please do. Um, you talked about aspiring vows. Yes. Engaging yes. Vows. So do the aspiring vows up to come first? Yes. And then for a certain period of time before you take the engagement vows, or if they can both happen simultaneously, like not sim one um, sequentially in the same thing. So I've noticed, like, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he's many, many times online these days given the aspiring Bodhisattva vows where you're repeating a particular verse three times, and that's aspiring vows. But then also sometimes he'll give, like, when he's given a, a, a tantric at the once, I think. Oh, no, he's given Chen Resig empowerment a few times online. Um, has you, you do the engaging vows as well yeah. and they're the so when you say aspiring vows it's not actually vow like that you know um, we talk about the 18 mm -hmm. they talk about downfalls so um and just like with the Prada Moksha vows no killing no stealing no lying um, so the 18 and then 46 secondary ones so that comes along in the engaging Vows. It sort of made you made a bigger commitment. It's basically it, it says vows, but actually it's one vow. Yeah, the vow to be, become a Buddha to the benefit of all sentient beings. That's the vow. So that's the entrance you would say to the Mahayana path. However, when we take refuge and bodhicitta, say within our tradition. We take when we take refuge, we do the refuge and bodhicitta prayer. So, um, so that incorporates that prayer itself incorporates both refuge and bodhicitta because we're a Mahayana center. But actually, taking the vow then comes along subsequently. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, um, so one can just take the aspiring vow except if you're taking 
a tantric empowerment, then you would need to take the engaging dance. And interesting enough, um, Geshe Zopo um, was talking about uh, previously when he was last year in Indonesia and this group, uh, it was a pilgrimage and this group weren't all Buddhist, but they all took the Bodhisattva vows. They hadn't taken refuge vows, but they had taken Bodhisattva vows, which I, it's the first time I'd heard that. It sort of makes sense. I mean, it makes sense. It's not obviously he wouldn't do that if it was a fault. So they didn't have to become Buddhists, but aspire to become a Buddha is like, okay, you're saying you're aspiring to become a Buddha. Wow. Well, aspiring to become as kind as a Buddha. Well, they can use whatever term. I mean, His Holiness the Dalai Lama said Jesus Christ was a great Bodhisattva. So, you know. I wonder if it's more action oriented, and that's why it's easier to practice. Yeah. It's very action because it tells you how to do these practices. That's what we're we're going to go through. Okay. And anyone, you don't have to have a particular faith, I guess, to do those. Although, you know, when it comes to not teach, not um, uh, introducing emptiness to those who are untrained, you might think, mm, what's that one? Yeah. Uh, okay, so page 91, this first one, the perfection of generosity. I seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity. So any completion of these perfections, of these six perfections, is Buddha, you know, a Buddha completes those. So I don't feel like, oh, I'm not doing that perfectly right now. Welcome to the club. We're on the same boat there. I seek your blessings to complete the perfection of generosity through the guideline teaching of enhancing the mind that gives without attachment. So the giving, this is the key. So the key thing for generosity is it's an antidote to miserliness, to, well, directly to miserliness, but also at I suppose it's the same thing, grasping as things as mine. It is mine, not yours, it's mine. Um, and so that we get very attached to things. So this is cutting away at our attachment. You know? it, it's not, as we say with renunciation, it's not about giving everything away. Um, I mean, there are provisos about what not to give away uh, as well. I mean, some of those make sense to you, like not giving weapons to someone who's suicidal, for example. That's pretty clear. Um, we use our wisdom mind as well. But, it, uh, you know, we don't put ourselves in poverty <laughs> so that, you know, we, oh, I gave everything away. I've known people, even Buddhists, to do that. And it's just like, then you become a burden on other people. So that's not helpful. It's not skillful. It's not skillful. However, the practice of the perfection of generosity is, is the wish to give. So in some ways we have a lot, well, not in some ways, we have a lot of practices where we're visualising giving all our wealth, all our enjoyment, all our virtues to each and every sentient being. We visualize these in some of our Buddhist practices, right? So it's, have they received that? No. <laughs> so, for example, you know, um, you know, in the practice of um, love, you know, may you have happiness and the causes of happiness. In the four immeasurables, and sort of visualizing, well, in that case, it could be, you know, turning ourselves into a Dharma jewel and giving that. That's the most powerful thing you could give. So, giving the Dharma doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a Dharma teacher. It can be sponsoring the three books or giving books to a library or just in our way of speaking, directly or indirectly, introducing maybe you know, not even saying the word karma, not even saying some of those words, 
but just helping people to turn their minds maybe in a more positive direction or so forth. Um, you know, a friend of mine who complains about absolutely everything. And um, so, you know, I, I, I continue to introduce gently something so she doesn't get, you know, annoyed. Um, and I think, oh, well, can't see it having an impact. She's still complaining about everything. <laughs> However, the, this morning she sent me a message because she's in Sydney and it was sunny. And I said, oh, enjoy the sunny day. And she said, you are my sunshine. So wasn't that nice? Okay. So, I mean, she says these things. So obviously some impact that's well hidden phenomena to me. So we don't really know how we're influencing people. Yeah. So in different ways. Um, yeah, so practice of generosity. Um, the guideline teachings of enhancing the mind that gives without attachment. So the teachings on, you know, self-grasping, on attachment, on how deluded we are thinking these things um, are mine, even my body. I like the thing that says it's a sort of, it's a guest house and we're visiting. Is that correct? Isn't the body's a guest house? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it says, transforming my body, wealth, and the collections of virtues over the three times, past, present, and future. So transforming them into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. So, so it's saying, um, in the practice of giving, as it says in the Four Immeasurables, in, in Lama Zaparimita, it says, to give everything that beings want and need, and then you think, but what they want is maybe not what they need. So therefore, this is where we use skillful means. If if I know that if I know that somebody's going to they're wanting money and they're going to use it for drugs, I'm not going to give it to them for drugs, but I will offer to buy them a meal or you know give them some food or something like that. So. It's been very, very skillful in that way. My body, wealth, and collections of virtues over the three times, past, present, and future. So that wish to give, you know, any, of course, if we're, we're, if we are able to physically give, what we talk about is giving of material support, you know, giving money is a, um, you know, charities and so forth is, is a common practice in society, isn't it? Um, yes, Yvonne. I rejoice. It feels like an incredibly powerful practice. Yeah. Mindfulness and for generosity because we have all this Of course, when we realize how fortunate we are, yes, the gratitude of all the things we have, we have. Yeah. And then we can give them away, so we put them on our own. Giving, giving things away, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, if your neighbours appreciate, fantastic. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, giving away plant cuttings, as you say, doesn't cost a thing and it spreads the love. Yeah. It's giving spaciousness to yourself, yeah, to, the yeah. to the mind by decluttering. Yeah, fabulous. I absolutely have go for it. That is a wonderful practice. Yeah, and of course there are provisos about, as I said, about what not to give. It says don't give away like putrid food or. <laughs> well, unless you're giving it to the worms in the <laughs> compost, they'll yeah, happily to enjoy it. No, to them it's delicious. <laughs> there you go, giving to the compost, right? Mm -hmm. Giving to all those beings. Why not? It's a matter of mind training. Simply that we don't have to necessarily change what we are doing, changing the way we're thinking about what we're doing in that way. We're cultivating this mind of wishing to give 
and recognize them when we are able to do that. So we can look at that in very many, many ways. There are ways in which, when I was saying about putrid food, what came to actually to mind, um, and the example that came to mind was when I was at Chenrezig, but it happens in many dharma centers. <laughs> but Chenrezig is a big property and people would dump their old couches and I'd say dump and, oh, I'll take this to centre. They want that, you know, the mouldy cane furniture. And it's like, no, they don't want it now. They have to get rid of it. You know, <laughs> you know that's, that's pretty obvious that, but it apparently wasn't to those people who did that. I'm not sure it would have been easier for them to take it somewhere else than to leave it with us. Well, all the charities have signs up about the charities and the charity bins and all of yeah. that, yeah. Please do not dump things that are not saleable. Mm. Oh, okay, you know, it has to be saleable. Yeah. yeah, no, thanks. We don't want your rubbish. <laughs> so there's context. Giving medicine. Uh, one of my friends um, from Chen Resig Institute had this real passion for giving nuns um, vitamins. Right, and so she wanted to set up a project for nuns in in Nepal. Because my experience, a few times of going to Nepal, um, there was a, a monk at the centre when I was in Sydney, and it, and you'd say, "Oh, I'm going to Nepal," and he'd say, "Oh, could you take all these vitamins for my family?" And I said, "Don't they have vitamins in Nepal?" And he said, "They don't have good quality, so I'd be taking bags of vitamins for his family." And so she was setting up something like that for the for the nuns. As well, just you know, being inspired by this one little thing to take on as a project and it's really lovely. So yeah, it was, it was very good. Um, so that's giving medicine, you would say. Um, giving shelter, housing. I, I, I read this in the news feed. I think it was yesterday. It's wonderful. Feel good. You know, they have the feel good news. Um, the good news and uh it was this homeless couple and their kid or kids had been camping out and and it, they had jobs but this is the crisis isn't it of homelessness um no home and so i thought oh, you just got to have a they're booked into a motel right they could pay they can pay and this motel had like one area was for the travelers, the tourists and travelers and whatever. And the other area was for homeless people. You had to pay rent, uh, it was equivalent to a week's, like an average week's rent. It wasn't expensive, actually equivalent to, hmm, that's usually what you pay for a night rather than a week. Anyway, you could see where the people who owned it were coming from. And then they got talking and the people who owned it found out this couple could clean, could do this, could, could do that, and offered them a job and a house. Ta-da. They're the assistant managers or something. Yeah, the managers or assistant managers. They got a house. <laughs> they went from a tent to a house. <laughs> so how wonderful, you know, these. Um, and you're just so inspired by people who do that sort of thing. There's many examples, right? Okay. Also, it's usually nice when someone just gives you a little gift. Isn't just a, it? Yes. And, you know, that can bring around with you for, for a long time. Yes, it's the thought behind just giving you a, a little gift, you know. And there's there's one thing, like, I guess you saw Trim who was here recently. Yeah, the plant, yeah. Yeah. And it does create these bonds in yeah. your community. Yeah. That's really nice. Speaking of which, um, are there still lemons out there and grapefruits? They're from the tree next door. And Susan came over yesterday because I said we have such an abundance of citrus at the moment, like everybody else. And so I was like, give them away, of course. So I'm just saying over the subsequent weeks, <laughs> like the pumpkin, yeah. it's not the first one. I actually... I gave him a pumpkin before, I think. Or maybe I gave that to the gardener. I'm not sure. <laughs> Got a watermelon coming up. 
it's not quite ready yet. It's so exciting. And then it's like, hey, can we give this? You know? So there's a tradition here of people going and getting lemons off the tree. So please join the tradition. <laughs> oh, yeah? Please take what's here. There's more coming up. I would have put more in the thing here, but Susan's the gardener, so she picked the ones that were hot to trot, so to speak. But I think they're coming up. Anyway, we'll bring some across. It's wonderful because I was sitting there talking to her about it yesterday, and then I looked next door and I thought the tree is abundant with lemons. Nobody's not got lemons. <laughs> but you know, Tara Meditation Center does that because they're also um, a community of growers because their houses are they're able to grow. And so one time there'll be a whole bunch of letters and like that. oh, it's wonderful. Finger limes. Finger limes, yeah. 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 Yeah, that is one of the... They all cook and allow them to be preserved. Yeah, so. it's, and it, it is the joy of that, of just giving you... I, I, I started off saying about Geshe Sultan, he would say, this is not an advertisement. He would say every time... He, he would go and see his teacher every day when he was in the monastery and he would always give him something. Every day. Mm -hmm. Wow. It was probably like... Yeah. Yeah, you know, pomegranate, and they have lots of pomegranates yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. The thought of giving. Extra. The thought of giving. So just training our mind in that um, thought of giving. So giving material, giving um, yeah, material things, housing, um, medicine, food, clothing. I mean, giving your clothing to the charity people. I mean, the clothing that is reasonable, not the, when it's in rags. Although I was, I was saying to Venerable Pekar this morning, I don't know in Perth where you take the clothing that can be made into rags. So, yeah, if, if ever you want to drop some off, because near my in Fremantle, um, okay. the recycling centre, they've got particular bins that's for, for fabric to be... Recycled. Cycle. So it's not. It might be rags. It might be. I mean, yeah. there's a whole recycled yeah. fashion yeah. business. And, yeah. So, so I don't have the This one here in Perth. There we go. Great. Fabulous. Great initiatives. I mean, we have things like. Food bank and all of those and um, yeah, many opportunities um, for that. So, so just what else about giving? Yeah, and then there's this one. Of course, being generous with the with the Dharma, as I said, you know, we can sponsor we can sponsor the Dharma. You know, um, generosity of giving others. Fearlessness. So that doesn't have to be actually relieving people of fear because, again, you're talking about Buddhahood. Gone beyond fear is Buddhahood. And I'm saying, mm, I don't think I can attain, I, I don't think I can give to someone else because I haven't attained that yet myself. So that's very clear. But we could think of ways. Um, if, so, for example, Bonka Rimshe talks about now. This one I find a bit tricky. Liberating prisoners from jail. So having worked in the Liberation Prison Project for a very, very long time, and there was one guy who wrote to Lama Zopra and said, I took your advice, I liberated myself. In other words, he snuck out in the prison and got caught and had to go back inside, yeah. No, not that. But I thought about the fact that offering the Dharma in the prisons to prisoners as a way that they use that time to turn their lives around, turn their minds around, and then from from going from a practice of taking, they think, well, what can I give back? And just seen that happen so many, many times. So in that context, yet yeah. Or saving beings from drowning. This is one we can easily do. You know, it's running at the moment, so the insect saving just takes one move of a hand, very gentle. Um, saving insects or... So, and giving little sun shades to worms in the summer. Mm -hmm. 
or giving them nice moist compost that's their sunshine. Yeah. As you can see, the neighbor energy is in there. Yeah. Is it because they could all be considered? Exactly. We are all, yes, that's what Lama Zopa says. He says, you know, the, the, those that are in the physical prison know they're in a physical prison. All of us are in a mental prison and we don't know it. Yes. So that, hey, go for it. There's many ways we can do that. Definitely many ways we can be liberating ourselves <laughs> as prisoners of our own minds. Yes. I, I worked at a community centre in Fremantle for yes. a while ago and I found that a lot of the people that I've been supporting, they're at risk of homelessness or, or homelessness. Yes. Or something. And I found that they would be the most generous people that I've come across. Yes, homeless. Even though they wouldn't have money. Yes. So they knew what it was like. So I've got an, yes, I know. I, I saw that one woman I gave, um, it was $10, but it was two $5 notes. And while we were talking, her mate came along and she gave one to him. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Just like that. Mm -hmm. So it is. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing this um, fundraising 101 when I was working in an aid agency. And the woman mm -hmm. who was leading that said, People who give are people like you, like people who don't have mm -hmm. yeah. know the value of giving. Yeah. She said, People who have, and this is the mind of attachment, have, and know how to have. So yeah, give. Yeah, that's true. Right. We always think, oh, the top end of town. We're just like, oh, no, actually, we've been talking about this, you know, the neighbour, the this, the that, just regular, everyday people. It's true. Um, yeah. So fearlessness. Um, yeah, saving insects from drowning or, um, you know, helping people across the road, um, examples like that. Ordinary things that we are capable of doing. I'll give you a good example. Give me a good example. I was catching the bus home from the city yesterday. Yeah. And I was just, I mean, everybody has just got their own seat on the bus. Nobody's sitting next to each other. No, everyone sits, you and know, it's like place. the whole bus seat is mine. <laughs> I looked up and then there was a tiny bird flying through the bus. Wow. Oh. And then I started to engage with this man. There's a bird on the bus. And so he kept, he got the bird and I had to get off. And he said, he said, oh no, I'll hang on, I'll, I'll look after. So you could never, I'm getting off here. He got off and then it flew. This is interesting uh, thing about um, just. Yeah, releasing the bird from the bus. Yeah, and wonderful. Saving insects. Yeah. A tiny, tiny bird. Yeah. And then it flew out, landed on the wall, on this wall. Yeah. In total state of shock. And then I just got it and I had to put it somewhere where it was going to where it was safe. Home. Yeah. Yeah. And just that small little interaction. That's you know, massive. Was... I'm impressed that he caught a bird. Yeah. <laughs> I'm flying oh, around yeah. in panic. Oh, I've never been managed to do that. Like we had a bird in here one day that was sort of wanting to lock up, but the bird was still here. And in the end, because every move you made. Yeah. The bird would be more frightened and yeah. fly away. And so, and ta -da, what did they say to do? Leave the door open and they'll find their way out. And that's, it happened in its own time, not that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I said, you had another person who was also concerned about the little bird. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's yelling at the driver, there's a bus, on, there's a bird on the bus, there's a bird on the bus. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, when I was at Vajrayana Institute, because we had, we were in, it's in Victoria square so it's a square and there's um rainbow lorikeets and there was this little baby rainbow lorikeet that was injured and the woman next door you know there were many things about her that irritated the whole street to the extent that the <laughs> parking rangers would tell her she doesn't own the parking spots, spots, good big house, outside her house, which is now actually VI's house. But, you know, oh, back then. That one. Oh, yeah. yeah, that one. Anyway, she, a lot of things, she really rubbed people up the right, wrong way. But one Friday afternoon in the pouring rain, both of us were out there saving this rainbow lorikeet and bringing it in, finding it accommodation <laughs> and ringing wires and all of that. 
And I thought, how that was joyous, you know, really, mm. like you said, you know, working together to <laughs> save a poor darling bird. Yeah. Um, so in in summary, as it Bodhisattva's way of life, perfection of generosity is mentally, mentally giving to all beings. All your possessions, all your karmic fruits, your virtues. Thus, generosity must be in the mind. And in terms of giving the body, as it says, so it says in the LC 101, um, transforming my body, wealth, and collections of virtue over the street into the objects desired by each and every sentient being. So there is a proviso about giving your body. You know, there's many stories of body bodhisattvas and like the Buddha, you know, cut, you know, cutting the thigh and giving to the tigress and this and that as a proviso, do not do that. Unless you're a bodhisattva who cutting off a part of your body as, as inconsequential as a leaf falling from a tree. Can pretty safely say no, <laughs> not allowed to. But I do think about you know, of course, can give blood, can give organs. A big debate I'm opening up there. Um, yes, weeks. I know. Venerable Pekar, her and her her ordination sisters, the four of them, though, when they ordained, and one had very long hair. And uh, the, but the whole, oh, you were all able to give hair because they used oh, the, sh yeah, oh yeah, but the shorter hair they can put on the hat. That was mine. Oh, your hair. But but for her has been really long. She could. This was Venerable Compton who was here. She was yeah, she had, she had hair. very long hair, and she said, "I am so attached to my hair." And I said, "Well, you better get over that if you want to be because she wanted to be okay." <laughs> she she also, she gave it away. Yeah, she also went to an organisation that had to be cancer. cancer. Yeah. And mine was only like there, so mine could go under the hat for people with cancer, like to get a happy body. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the other two had short hair and they yeah. didn't offer. It was I, too short. Yeah. So it's good to know, right? Yeah. It's a very good it's example. Fun. Can give your hair. Mm. Can give your old glasses when you. No yeah. use to you anymore. And, and, and some organs can as well keep you can be keep you need, yeah. like alive. And li like, while you're alive, you yeah. can give yeah. Yeah, to save the family Yes. Well, there's that circular way of doing it where I'm not too sure how it works, but it's one yeah. of these things like yeah. triangular. Yeah. But if that's one where it's not at the time of death. It's not at the time of death, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Uh, the perfection of morality ethics. So this is on the basis of the vows that we take. So at this point, we're talking about the um, pattern moksha vows, individual liberation vows. Those when you take refuge, you take those, and then the body site for vows. The complexion of uh, the perfection of moral discipline, which is about, you know, training our body and our speech to only engage in beneficial activities, not in anything that's going to do it any harm. And not uh, working for the sake of sentient beings, enacting virtuous deeds, and not transgressing the bounds of the Prada Moksha, Bodhicitta, and Tantric vows, whichever vows we've taken, even at the cost of my life, which sounds a bit intense, isn't it? A bit tricky, isn't it? I think going to bed would have faced some of that. People, yes. People, a lot of people in Tibet face that. So, you know, the Pow uh, this powerful story that um, a true story stays in my mind. It starts off this, um, it's a true story, I said that didn't it? Um, elderly woman in uh, Dharamsala who's already now a nun. 
But what happened was when she was in Tibet as a teenager, the parents were trying to marry her off and she kept running away and saying, I don't want to be, I want to be a nun. I don't want to get married. And so then her father said, okay, I'll tell you what, we won't keep trying to marry you off if you um, will train. He was the village leader, if you'll train and, and take over from his village leader, which you did. And then the Chinese invasion happened and then she was put in prison for 20 years. Sorrow Mountain. I think someone should look at my videos. It's so amazing. It's very amazing. And while she was in prison, not only herself, but other Tibetans, they, they were... Um, pushed by torture um, to rat on each other, but no one did. And the torture is horrific, but nobody said anything about anyone else. So they were just tortured more. And then when she was in solitary confinement, she worked out it was completely dark and muddy where she was in solitary confinement, but she realised that the space was long enough that she could do prostrations in the mud. And so she did her nyandra. And she said there'd just be this one little bit of light every day when this little, you know, thing in the door would open and there'd be some food come in. And that was it. So she was there quite a while. That was solitary confinement. So I liked when the guys in prison and just say, oh, that's luxury. <laughs> right there. So, yeah, pretty intense. And so... She, anyway, she eventually got released and got to Dharamsala and got to live her dream. And then she set up an organisation for Tibetan women and so forth herself. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so even at the cost of her life, as, yeah, many of our Tibetan friends, most Tibetans that you come across here, like not the little kiddies, but their parents, um, have all been um, prisoners, they're all refugees and all been imprisoned, yeah. And there are many stories from the world wars who aren't Many in the world wars, yeah, yeah. Who are risking their lives to protect, protect others, others. Yeah. Yeah. Protect other people. Yeah. Um, the world being eventually not discovered, but you were risking your life. And yeah. Having an yeah, people were risking their life anyway, but then you see, you know, they take greater risk, like take the bullet instead of their mate or, you know, throw themselves over their mates or they don't, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are real, real stories, you know, people do. And so it's a it's a it's a sort of it's very courageous, isn't it? Very courageous act. But you know, then we talk about ethics in terms of you know we live in a very quite obviously unethical world. So um, from liberation of the palm of your hand, there's a number of different points about the ethics of working for the sake of sentient beings. It's helping those, which is what we've just been talking about, um, helping those who toil, like labour, and those who suffer, which is all of us, <laughs> everybody, all bit sentient beings, working of those, um, working for the sake of those blind to the right method. So here we're talking about ethics in relation to dharma, shall we say. They might be fellow Dharma practitioners or they might be racist or something and we might challenge that in whatever skillful way we can do. So not the right methods. Working for the sake of people by benefiting them in whatever way we talked about with generosity. Working for the sake of those threatened by danger. That's what we were just talking about in war situations. Working for the sake of those afflicted with um, miseries. So there might be physical difficulties, there might be mental health issues, there might be um, 
medical, you know, that's medical. Like firefighters. Yeah, people who've uh, and overwhelmed by, who are doing those things, yeah. Okay. And then they hope to be each other. <laughs> well, they do. And if we talk to, to John here, he's, he's just, I have to say yet again, resigned from the um, fireys because he's just, they're all exhausted over the past eight months and the fires haven't even stopped, you know, down south there's still fires going. I said, John, you've done this before. He said, yeah, I, I do this and then I just can't help myself. <laughs> Because he also trains the fireys as well, and all it's all voluntary, right? Yeah, so that need is great and greater. Working for the sake of the deserted, so those who, let's say, not just homeless, or maybe they're drug addicts and being deserted by their family, or maybe they you don't even have to be a drug addict to be deserted by the family. You know that are totally isolated. People who aren't help, yeah. They've got no, there's no help. Um, working for the sake of the homeless, working for those, sake of those without like-minded people. That's interesting because in the context of, of Dharma, you know, if you've got fellow Dharma students who are in an isolated place and there's no one, or, or whatever, there's no one like-minded that they can engage with. Fortunately, today we've got Zoom and, um, well, we've got telephones and so forth, but thinking, oh, how can I support, benefit that person? And even for ourselves, uh, as I get older, I think about this, what if you end up in a nursing home and there's no like-minded people? Yeah, I think thinking about that as well. Yeah. It's really difficult. And it doesn't have to be around Dharma, like... <laughs> My mother, she was in this independent living. My, my parents were in this independent living for 22 years. They were the longest <laughs> residents. But she got to a point where she said, I can't have a conversation with anyone around here. They're all gaga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She wouldn't be alone in that situation. No. But just finding someone like-minded who has like-minded interests interests like i visited a woman in a nursing home the other day and i thought she's totally isolated she's just in her room and she's totally isolated mm -hmm. right it's interesting the article that you referenced earlier about, about the homeless yourself. yeah and then i read that this morning and then i went down a, to two other articles one was about supporting men coming out of prison but then there was another one about um Women over 55 who are now one of the greatest mm. cohorts of endless people due to late stage divorce, all of those kinds of things. Yeah, losing, yeah. yeah, being homeless because you've been divorced and you don't have the assets. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, um, there was also something about who were victims of domestic violence and all the domestic violence are yes. full. Yes. And so women against small children are living in their. Oh, yes. Yeah, but there was this, it, I think it was over the East, there was a community set up that was like um, a similar kind of situation where it was uh, tiny houses. Oh, and yeah, the tiny houses. Yeah. Predominantly yeah. women. Yeah. And they yeah. Had all kinds of houses and they, they had various yeah. history around what. But the, there was one line that really made me smile. It was like, with my buddy system, we'll be checking on each other. Yeah, having buddy systems, yeah. actually. Yeah. And when, you know, talking about where my mother was, however, they ha did have this buddy system where in the whole village, it was only a small village. And it was, if you don't see my blinds open, if you don't see, like, yeah. they had certain mm -hmm. cues. And if you don't see that, you know, alert someone. Yes. You know, so they had that everyday mm. check-ins with each other. Yeah. yeah. Right. We had that in the, um, I lived in a block of houses, public housing in Canberra, and um, so there were 10 of us, and, yeah, we looked out for each other, and it was because of other people living. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was very nice. Yeah. yeah. And this is the thing, this is the neighbourly, like, because giving that plan to your neighbour, um, it's neighbourly connection. 
you know. I didn't meet oh, sorry, I didn't meet her then either. The neighbor here till oh. that they were um now we're trying to get back in. Where people were trying to break in. They tried to break in here and then there. Um yeah, you've got to be careful when you there are break-ins to cars around here, by the way. Um but uh you know it sort of took a crisis. Um mm -hmm. But you don't want it to really take a crisis. On the other hand, we don't go, you know, as I say, you used to be able to just drop in on people and now you've got to sort of make appointments. There's a lot of um, articles about that. <laughs> it's true. Isn't it? Used to be, what was it? Um, offering a cup of sugar or a cup of milk to the neighbour who just moved in. <laughs> you have that tradition in Germany. Oh, you give them bread and dip. Oh, this is class. Salt in it. Give them salt and acid. Uh -huh. And you would bring the bread to the neighbor and together you would break the bread and give them some oh, together as breaking the bread together as a neighborly so bonding. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, well consider the basis of life. Also because salt was so valuable, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. wonderful. Bring it all back. Um, working for the sake of those on the right path, which is each other, the centre, and so forth. You know, so we we want to uh, we want the centre to continue to flourish, and we want to support each other. Our dharma buddies, you know, literally we are each other's dharma buddies. Especially if we don't see someone for a while, well, just sort of ring and see how you're doing. You know, we don't know what's going on. And then working for those on the wrong path, which is similar to the ones using the wrong methods. Working for the sake of all these people through miracles, that's probably something a bit advanced. <laughs> because it's said that generally those who can, you know, do these miraculous things don't advertise. There was when Lama Zoparumpashe was you know, young, quite young and recognised as a reincarnate lama, reincarnation of Kung San Yeshi. And one day they were out walking and it was raining and someone said to him, well, if you're such a great lama, make the rain stop. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can. Otherwise an umbrella really works. <laughs> well, Dalai Lama too and um, it in Sydney one time, we hosted him for this uh, conference. The first time we hosted him for one of the happiness and its causes conference, first time it went huge when we were in Sydney Convention Centre, it was then, now it's rebranded. And so the damage was such that overnight, um, the rain had come onto the stage and guess which seat was the one that was rained upon was the one the Dalai Lama was going to sit in. And not only that, Malcolm Turnbull was the um was going to be speaking. He was at that point in time the Minister for Water. And so there were all these uh, all these jokes about well he's not here but we can feel his presence. <laughs> in any case, um he was doing an outdoor event at the botanic gardens or domain domain and it was pouring with rain such that we all had stalls and we everyone abandoned their stalls it was just it was a washout so his holiness comes onto stage the sun comes out everyone's quite happy his holiness goes off stage rain i just like i want that Mary. <laughs> But they can also make rain, you see. And they'd say, when you invite these llamas like, to a country like ours, to a state like ours, which is enjoying rain after how many months, ask them to make rain. Mm -hmm. We don't do it. They can. So they would. So those, you know, when we request llamas to do things, if they're capable of doing it, like when the Dalai Lama asked Keti Essentia Rinpoche to go down to Antarctica, and do practices to help 
balance the realign the planet in terms of the weather. He did. Because he can. Anyway. Um, so morality, may, yeah, holding our vows even at the cost of your life. So even we may not at the cost of our life, it's, it's saying how seriously we take them. It's not an option or extra. And for that, we therefore need to know what vows we've taken. Otherwise, we don't know. And the more we go along, the more vows there are. So um, for us, example, you know, we have um, at this, it's called novice level, which we don't want really to debate about that either. But um, 36 vows on top of the five plus 18 plus 46, <laughs> you know, they add up is all I'm saying. They do add up. So the practice of patience is the one most needed in the world today. Without, you know. So this is the antidote to anger, practice of patience. Um, I'm just, yeah, I might as well read it then really to myself, from the Bodhisattva's way of life. So there's a whole, um, the Bodhisattva's way of life by Shantideva has a chapter on each of the perfections. And there's many, many, many verses. The one on patience has every permutation of anger that you could think of and how to antidote it. Lama Zopa Rinpoche, the book out here on patience. So it's on that. So this is, um, this is the one to really train our minds in. Why? Because there's so much anger in them. You know, maybe not our anger, but around us. And so we can, without changing our mind, be easily influenced by the anger of others. You know, that we can feel ourselves reacting to that, even we're not an angry person as such. You can feel that. And it's a very disturbing state of mind, very disturbed and disturbing state of mind. So if we're thinking about, you know, I want to develop single point of concentration, no way with anger in your mind, it's not going to happen. So here Shani Deva says, unruly sentient beings cannot all be subdued and they are as vast as space, but the patient are not discouraged. So this is, you know, because you say, yes, I can be patient, like one of the guys in prison first guy I visited, actually, he said, at the start of the day, I was meditating, all very peaceful. And he said, five minutes later, my cellmate pissed me off. It was just like, well, you had that time before that five minutes later. You had that time when your mind was peaceful. It is possible. But you think about it, you know. I just... And one, you know, having visited many people in prison, that sort of thing. How would you be? You're in this situation where not only are you in prison, but you're, you know, being reminded of whatever it was that put you into prison on a daily basis. But also, you're sharing a cell with someone you haven't chosen to share a cell with, who's also there because of, you know, so you're doing your crazy mind and their crazy mind and small space and all of that. That itself is a practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That itself is a practice. And no privacy. Well, Absolutely no privacy mm -hmm. whatsoever. Yeah. Um, the patient are not discouraged. So this is like in the face of adversity where we're challenged. You know, um, I can be as patient as anything as long as everything's going along smoothly. I'm very patient. But, you know, just watch when our mind gets even the slightest bit irritated by the slightest thing. That's when we have control over it and can do something about it. Um, the, con uh, the patient are not discouraged and can be conquered only by angry thoughts. If this, hap if this happens, it is like defeat at the hands of all. In other words, patience is defeated by anger. So it totally hijacks the mind. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. And also, as Shanti Dover said, there's no sin. I find the sin word difficult. Disturbance, <laughs> like hostility, 
adversity like hostility or maybe sin. There is no austerity like patience. Okay. So the first one, the patience of remaining calm in the face of attackers. You don't just sort of go, yeah, just go ahead and attack me, but you don't let your mind sink to the level of them, shall we say. Because with a patient mind, you can, you've got control of your mind to see how best to handle the situation. And the best thing may be what? Walk away. If at all possible, walk away. Best thing, get some distance. Mm. I think arguing with anger is like arguing with an alcoholic. It's just totally, because it is, the, the mind becomes totally irrational. Just think, if you record what you say in an angry outburst and play it back later, you'd be so like, really say that, really, really do that, you know. Um, okay, so this is our, our main training and it, it's, um, of course, it's difficult, but we, we try it out in small situations because I think, okay, I don't have to think about attackers. I can think, can I be patient? Okay, I might have to experience this as I go to the airport. I'm glad I wasn't there yesterday. Is all I can say. <laughs> I'll be patient at the airport. <laughs> well, driving in traffic. Is driving in traffic. You know, there's many examples of where we can practice patience. We circle our own space and just like see how patient I can be in this situation. That and that way we build up our capacity. It's like with the generosity being the wish to give, not necessarily giving. Yeah, it's just like okay, don't practice patience with adversity when things don't work out according to our plan. It is, it is interesting, I, I mean, I'm sure they do in there too, and maybe it's different ways of saying it, but it is really good to have like five things that you do when you know. <laughs> five things you, you do when you know that person's going to push your buttons. Absolutely, plan ahead. Plan ahead. Yeah, if, if A doesn't work, plan B, C, D, E. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Or, you know, use your buddy and say, now, if this happens, I want you to take me away. I want you to. <laughs> Could you just call me at this time? <laughs> yeah, strategize. Strategize, absolutely. Planning ahead. <laughs> um, and it came to a point where it was consuming the, the narrative and the thoughts. It was consuming how I was looking at yeah. things. So I yeah. had a sort of a couple of weekends ago, I had, to have, had a, bit of a, a bit of an attitude adjustment, so to speak, and sort of I don't know, focus and one of, and it's about it is about putting in strategy. One mm -hmm. of the strategies in this particular environment, I can't rely on the others, uh, others because I can't draw others into the situation. So it's almost like I go into each conversation and almost resetting each conversation before I go into the conversation. Yeah, setting your motivation before yeah. the conversation to be of benefit. And, and it's interesting, I was going back to things, certain ways of looking at I came up with the word to be graceful. Be graceful, and, yes, and I like was, that. And it was just the thing that resonated with yeah. So how can I, I know what that looks like, I know what that feels like. So if I go into this, how can I be graceful? Because in work, yeah, so in a difficult work situation, how can I be graceful in this yeah. situation? And it might feel like, we're just putting, playing a part, but that's how we train. Well, it's it's, it's really, training. Really yeah. Be instead of going down yeah. Yeah. So it's practicing. Going the path of grace, and then it becomes over time. It becomes spontaneous. The, yeah. Yeah. That's the default 
Yeah. Just for a while, there's a difficult last thing while I was thinking about that. It was good, but it's getting hijacked a lot. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
having to accept what you're able to do and even planning, you know, like if I do this, I'm going to have to have two days of not that or whatever. And it's a thing of acceptance. This is how my life is because it's the mind saying, I want this to be different, but it's not different. So a mind of... Well, you can join the online. <laughs> Or you can just see your unwell to do that. Because that takes a long time. Yeah, even you're too unwell to do that. And you look, you accept that, well, there are all these times when I'm okay to do that. Today's not that day. Mm -hmm. And there will be times again. It's just not right now. Yeah, we have to, you know, sort of, it's hard, isn't it? Because it's debilitating in itself. You know, I had a broken leg. Yeah, like, oh, there's a lot of there's a lot of hidden illness. Yeah, I get amazed sometimes with young people. I don't know why I think young people are all fit and healthy, and then I realize they're not. They're in agony. Mm. You know, physically. I'm just talking physically, and that it's just like they they don't look like that, but they are. And so, yeah, it's just yeah, it is it is very very tricky. I was thinking of the first song. No, I was too. <laughs> yeah, she got up and kind of fatigued. And she sort of described it like, I've got this much energy. And so she Yeah, what do I do? Of, I've only got this much energy. So what do I do with that? She strategizes, she plans, and, you know, she does have better times and she has worse times. With the Dharma, she's very, very skillful. Um, what she does on her bad days, I was just like, I, I couldn't do on a good day. Yeah. Because she's very, very creative. What's she making at the moment? Lanterns for their 15 yeah, years so, celebration at Chenrezig. Um, so she's, she's found mm. the ways that work for her. Yeah. And she's had to get used also to saying no on sorry when I can't do it. But she'd, whatever but she whatever she can do this. But I can't do this and do on money pad me homes along the same time. Yeah. So it could, it could yeah. almost turn it into mindfulness practice. Exactly. This amount of energy. Yeah. Do I want to spend this this amount on watching TV? Yeah. yeah. That's, That's the sort of thing she does. Is that what she does? Yeah. yeah. Well, she says so. Like, I can't, I can't leave home if you like. Maybe not even leave the bed. But what I can do in bed is, you know, and she because she's crafty. She'll do some craft thing, but she says, I'm always doing like dharma -related a dharma things. practice along with it. Yeah. Mm. Not, you know, on many Padmihong is not a, you have to think about type of practice to do. She's done a lot of mantras. She listens to a lot of teachings because you can learn that from her doing that. Mm. And um, yeah, she zooms sometimes other than going in person. And, Regret's an action step, a regret, and it doesn't apply in this situation. There's no regret in this situation. It's okay, but the guilt is not. The guilt is. It's not giving yourself permission. Yeah, yeah it's, well, it's yeah. a matter of looking, um, I would be, I would look at, okay, guilt, what's your story? <laughs> What is it that, you know, why are you here? You're not serving me whatsoever. It's, and realize that there's no inherent guilt. It can feel pervasive. But really, it's a mere state of mind. You're not guilt, feeling guilty all the time. Mm -hmm. um, 
feeling guilt all the time. But um, that guilt is very, very debilitating. Yes. More. And so I'm making myself more guilt. You're making me feel more tired than I was. So goodbye. Oh, yeah. Nat's so, got a good practice. Well, it was, it was another time in my life. I've got many opportunities. <laughs> yeah. so, we all have many opportunities yeah. to practice, patience. Yeah. <laughs> this is the time in which I was spending great time with myself at all. Like the internal dialogue was very complex. It's not what I would say or think about anyone else, but I was able to do it for myself. And I, and again, had a moment where I had a bunch of about what, what's the right antidote, what's the right practice. What antidote to practice, so, yeah. It is loving kindness, but I only focused on myself. So this was good meditation. So it's similar to like to the Tom Lane, but this one I was, okay, I'll start with myself. And every morning in my morning meditation, for quite a few days, I couldn't, I found it so challenging. I was just crying all the way through. This was so, it was so, it sort of felt so out of step. And then after about 10 days, someone at work had said, you're in love. And I actually thought I was in love. Of not being love. Being, yeah, I could see it could be seen that my relationship with myself had changed. Yeah. But um, that's very important. It was. It was. It was yeah, no, no, no. It was, I was, it was, when she said it, I thought, I knew I felt different. So there you go, life. loving kindness, because um, patience and loving kindness go together as an antidote to anger. Mm. So uh, so yes, we need that loving kindness towards ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just as like Sharon Salzberg is really good on this. Have you encountered Sharon Salzberg? So if you go online, all her meditations are about loving kindness. And... Um, and so it's about cultivating that towards ourselves, not even thinking about, I mean, of course there is that, I can't have it towards anyone else unless I have it towards myself. But we have to, particularly at times when we're not well, it's like practising Tong Len um, mm -hmm. towards ourselves, you know, giving loving kindness towards ourselves and you can visualise she doesn't do that. She comes more from, I think, a, a different tradition anyway. I won't say because I'll get it wrong. But um, it's just everything she does is loving kindness. She's had a lot of physical, to physical yeah. um, uh, illness to yeah. manage as well. Like you, you, like, yeah. Yeah. Tara Brack as well. Yeah. Again, with physical. Um, yeah. Dealing with physical difficulties yeah. and so forth. And 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 just I was thinking about my, my friend who was saying chronically and physically ill, because when I first oh, early on when I first met her, she was still trying to do some part-time work and so forth. And and she offered to to volunteer for this event, and it was only to do one thing on one day. And that day she was very like, can't get out of bed. But I was like, I have said I will do this. I'm going to do it. So I'm just going, please don't, please don't. You know, no, I'm going to do it. And I went with her and she wasn't able to do it. And the, wo the woman she was volunteering for got really angry. And I'm like, this is so unbearable on so many counts, you know, that it's, yeah, we have to, it's the acceptance thing, isn't it? Coming back to that and not feeling like, oh, I'm letting those, that's the guilt, you know, but I can't, I'm letting them down and them down. Well, your body's letting you down. You know, isn't it really? So this, I mean, having, doing, a, if you want to do a retreat on anything, do a retreat on loving kindness towards yourself. So. We could. At least we could organize maybe a weekend. Or... Yeah. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. It just feels cozy, doesn't it? <laughs> Under the doona, loving focus. <laughs> what was that? That's okay. That's fine. Yeah, and that'll be crying, and I don't know. You'll be get the whip, and we'll take the whip away from you. <laughs> Love and kindness towards ourselves. Self compassion, and we can look out for each other. Yeah. yeah, love and kindness. I like it. I'm just thinking of the food that would come from love and kindness. <laughs> We'd have yummy meals. Yeah. There's nothing you Very nourishing. Okay, I'll, I'll at least finish one bit more on patience, and then I'm revising, thinking maybe we need another week on the rest of the six perfections because this is really valuable um, discussion. So um, patience with our Dharma practice. Patience with ourselves in our Dharma practice. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I can't, you know, I'm not a good meditator. Lower your expectations, lower your expectations and like, whether you got here or you did it at home, <laughs> you didn't get here. Just, we're in here for the long haul, not for a quick fix. It's not, you know, there might be occasional ta-da's and they keep us going, right? Because we get a aha moment. You go, oh, even grabbing that, it's gone already. But, you know, that oh, I just think every little moment, join the dots. You know, they they build up, they build up. And it's just like, well, like the person I heard about, who I don't know, but I heard about, who made a commitment to meditate every day and he said himself, one minute. And he said, I never broke that commitment. And did he set for a particular period of time? Like I don't know, I didn't hear the rest of the story. All I know is he said one minute. And it doesn't mean he ever didn't do more than one minute, you know, more input, more, you know, better it gets. But if you set yourself an achievable amount of time, and this is when we're talking about Dharma practice on the cushion, but the real Dharma practice that we've been talking about is engaging with others and having patience with that. Okay. It was really, I was going down that way, but then I remembered can do it this way. I can plan. I can strategize. I can do it this way. And then sharing with others. Now we've all got ideas of how we can deal with these situations. So, you know. oh, I'll just tell you. Please, must tell. Well, you can just sit there. You don't have to meditate, but you do have to sit on the cushion. You don't have to meditate, but you do have to yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And ride at the cushion. You just got to sit there for 20 minutes. You don't need to have to meditate. Yeah. And you calm down. Yes. <laughs> You're sitting on the cushion. I'm sitting on the cushion. And the thing is, guys, because you've also got even muscle memory. Oh, sitting on the cushion means meditating. So I know what the deal is. Slowly, slowly. Oh, look, the number of times, I'm sure other people, the number of times I'd be like, I really don't want to do this, but I'll rule the columns of whatever, you know, yeah. or now it's on the computer, but it's much more fun when you have to, I'll just open the book. <laughs> oh, well, I might as well read. <laughs> just start. Just start. Just start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, folks. Lots of opportunities for practicing patience in our lives. There is no end of opportunities. And what do you do when you actually recognize that you did practice patience? Rejoice. Yeah. Yeah. And that way our mind gets more stronger, stronger. Yeah. All righty. And you can even just, okay, I didn't do what I've done as much as I thought, but look, I did this and I'm going to rejoice. Well, that. okay, I didn't do what I wanted, but I didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't do the negative thing. Okay. Yeah. Lower our expectations. Okay.
Thanks, everyone. It's been a wonderful morning. Dedicate all this positive energy, which I forgot to do after meditation. At least I remember to do the reflection. I'm just I have this meditation teacher who says, oh, don't do any of those things. <laughs> and so I get used to that. <laughs> Page eight. Kewadi nyudu da lama sange tripune dro wa chikamale pa de sala go pa sho jan chut sento brimpo she ma ke pa nam ke pu chi ke pa nyam pa me pa ya gong ne gong du pa wa shu. Next page, Long Life Prayer for His Holiness Dalai Lama. Incomparably kind and supreme, Tenzin Gyatso, the wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. And a prayer for the swift return of Lama Zonga Rinpoche. Peerless teacher and assembly of the children of the victorious one, Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas, Victorious Losang father and sons, along with the lineage masters, all the objects of refuge of infinite lands, please bestow the virtue and goodness of accomplishing this prayer here and now, holding and spreading the Muni's precious and complete teachings through explanation and practice. You wore the armor of patience that is never discouraged. Incomparable venerable guru, to you I make request. While striving single-pointedly for the sake of the victorious one's teachings, the soul gave way through which all benefit and happiness emerge and for mother living beings. You suddenly departed to peace. What a great loss. Nevertheless, through the undeceiving truth of the blessings of the ocean of the three jewels and the great waves of bodhicitta of the children of the victorious ones, May the smile of a reincarnation swiftly beam in glory for fortunate disciples. In the long life prayer for Tenzin Osul Rinpoche, Lord of Dharma, who in accordance with the various dispositions of those to be subdued, makes clear in the light of your well-spoken advice, the sacred Gandhian tradition, essence of Buddha's teachings, foremost and holy Lama to you are our supreme. We make this prayer of supplication, Lama, Please, please. Okay, so we will have another session on this module, so we won't be starting on that weekend, the next module. So we have that will be uh, the 20th and uh, 21st, one, 21st of July. Thank you very much. Thank you, Venerable Choki. Thank you. Take care. You too. Thanks.